Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about resurrection versus reincarnation. Yeah, we've done a video a while back looking at how our scripture was changed. You can find that study if you look for resurrection versus reincarnation on our channel. And you can see about how Justinian and those guys took it upon themselves to go in and change the words of the scripture. We've done that video a while back, but in response to some recent videos we've published, some individuals are asking questions about their whole reincarnation story, the whole resurrection story and they want some clarification all right so i've put together some stuff here this is um a real i've taken this class a lot more serious than i've taken the most classes as you can see i have a lot of uh verses that i'm gonna go down through here as we talk about uh reincarnation versus resurrection it is a very serious subject because you know we all want to this eternal life that we're promised nobody wants to die and be thrown in hell for forever and so we we really want to understand that and there's a lot of people who are working to get an understanding of this there is a lot of confusion associated with it and since we have the third testament of the bible that clears a lot of this up we're going to go ahead and go through and see if we can straighten this out for one time and for all all right now this may turn into a long video i'm not sure um i do have a lot of notes to go through i'm gonna try to keep it short but you know take it upon yourself to um listen through to the end don't quit halfway through you know go ahead and listen to it through the end you know don't be afraid of the information if, if you if you are serious in what you believe you shouldn't be afraid of challenges and those who have a different opinion i know i'm not i often uh listen to people with a different opinion than i have because you know either two things are going to happen either i'm going to um uh, gain some information from them maybe even find out something that I didn't know or my short my sword is actually going to get sharper in the process so you know stick with it stick around to the end um, go ahead and put it in the watch later list if you have to but I'm gonna try to jump right into this and I'm gonna jump right into it talking about Nicodemus which is one of the first times believe it or not that we hear about resurrection and reincarnation we're gonna jump in and talk about Nicodemus Demons over here in John chapter 3 verse 1 through 7. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Okay, now first of all, you notice that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. There was a big argument between the Pharisees and the Sadducees back during this time where the, the Sadducees actually be, they didn't believe in reincarnation resurrection they didn't believe in life after death they didn't even believe that human beings even had a spirit you know so and but the pharisees they did they believed in all of that and even some more and the Essenes did too uh, we don't hear about those too much in our king james version of the bible but that was a third group to go along with the pharisees and the sadducees they also believed in reincarnation or resurrection but we're going to go to clear up some of that and what it means here look at verse three he says jesus answered and said unto him verily verily i say unto thee except the man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God all right now there's only three times in our scripture that the word born again is is written down there there's it is twice here in the book of John that we hear about the word born again and the other one is over there and I believe in first Peter and we're going to take a look at that one too but let's go on he says Nicodemus saith unto him how can a man be born when he is old can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born Jesus answered verily verily I say unto thee except a man be born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of God that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit okay now as we work to try to clear up the the misunderstandings about resurrection one of the first things we have to do is recognize that we are spiritual beings and human fleshly beings we're actually more 
spiritual than we are fleshly if you consider the fact that our body actually goes into a hole and dies but our spirit man never dies it lives forever so we're actually more spirits than we are bodies because this body that we live in is only temporary but let's go ahead and clear this up right quick and to do so we're going to jump over to the third testament of the bible this is over here in chapter 11 which is the work of Jesus on earth. And we're, we're going to talk about this verse here as we explain resurrection. All right. It says 70 verse 73 says in that time, I said to Nicodemus who has sought me out in good faith to speak with me, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said to you that you must be born again who understood those words and I go on to say not many not many of us understood those words including myself but praise the father we do get we are getting some understanding here in these later days especially from this third testament of the bible and we can start to clear up some of these misunderstandings verse 74 says with them I wish to say to you that one human life is not enough to understand even one of my lessons and for you to come to understand the book that this life encompasses many existences are necessary to you therefore the flesh must serve only as a crutch for the spirit in his journey on earth all right now if you don't make it any further like i said i hope you make it to the end you should uh, take it upon yourself to make it to the end of this video but if you don't make it to the end that's what he's talking about and that's what he was explaining to nicodemus is that he was he was meaning that literally that you actually have to be born again born into another human being one lifetime is not enough for you to learn everything you need to learn in order to go on to these higher mansions there are seven levels to the to this um jacob's ladder and we 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 basically are on the first rung down here on earth and praise the father we get multiple opportunities in order to get this thing right it, it would be kind of bad if you know the, if the father you know he sent us down here to live out one lifetime and if we didn't get that right we were going to get cast into hell and burned forever you know that's what they teach down there teaching that false doctrine or whatever that that's not what's actually true so let's let's go on and go on to prove this fact he says that there are many existences necessary. There are many times that we need. We have to be born again. So, you know, but, you know, that's one of the problems with the um, with the guys down there. I don't want to call them out directly. Let me just say the guys down there at church, you know, they 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 are not necessarily studying as hard as they should be studying especially in modern churches where the the preachers have taken over the leadership role in the church it used to didn't be like that the preachers were used to be sm spokesmen where they would go to a bible study and you would have deacons or other more learned individuals that would take the time to teach the preacher what he needed to know so that on sunday he could come in and actually deliver the message he was kind of like the voice but he had a lot of individuals behind him that was actually teaching him but in today's churches we've elevated the preacher above everybody else in the church and so we have this individual there who was good at delivering a message but there's not a lot of studying going on there and so what ends up happening is he ends up parakeeting or repeating messages that he've heard from somewhere else and this is one of them he's heard somewhere that what uh, the word born again means and he's ran with that story even though there was a misunderstanding about what was going on he ran with his understanding of the word born again but what the Messiah was actually telling Nicodemus is you actually have to be born again uh, Nicodemus you're actually going to have to come back here or to earth and actually go through this thing again so you can further your study so you can get more of these lessons that you are going to you know learn down here but we're going to prove it we're going to prove it you know we ain't just going to talk we're actually going to use the scripture to prove it so let's let's see what we got next now let's go to the third testament chapter 30 verse 9 through 10 called the resurrection of the flesh properly understood the resurrection of the flesh is properly understood you know um, this message is not that resurrection is is false or that you know you know that 
the the message of this is that it's misunderstood and that's what we want to clear up is what actually is going on you know are dead people going to actually be walking around here on the earth or not what is he actually talking about and that's what we're working to clear up so let's look at verse 9 he says now the world will know the truth about resurrection of the flesh which is the reincarnation of the spirit when they were talking about resurrection in the new testament of the bible what they were actually talking about was the reincarnation of the spirit uh verse 10 says reincarnate to return to the material world to be born again as a man the emergence of the spirit in a human body for the continuation of a mission that is the truth about the resurrection of the flesh of which your elders have spoken giving it interpretations that were twisted as they were absurd okay now so this is this is what we're working to clear up here but you know notice this part right here where he says that they that what they were saying was twisted and absurd yeah because what they were talking about was actually individuals getting up out of the grave and walking around they, they were talking as if you was going to have these bodies that were going to be coming up and and um and you know walking around and that's not going to be the case at all um but the thing about it you know th there's a lot of people who listen to the stories that were told uh, about um, um, these bodies walking around and they just couldn't believe these stories and so you so there's no doubt that there's so many atheists in the world so many agnostics in the world so many people that don't have faith in the scripture in the world when you're telling them something like dead bodies are going to come up out of the grave and walk around you know it don't make sense to them and the scripture say it doesn't really blame those those individuals those atheists and those agnostics for not believing it actually blames the ministers those individuals that gave them this twisted and absurd story and expected them to believe it and this is not the only one there's some other ones you know that that um that some other things that you know people teach from the scripture that you know make the average man going hey that's impossible hey that ain't gonna work and you know that that don't sound right and it turns them off from the scripture so it's important for for us to understand this especially those who want to go on and carry the word it's, it's especially important for us to understand these facts because you know the Bible does make sense there may be some stuff in it that we don't understand and we don't get but if we actually dig down to find the truth we're actually gonna find out that it actually makes a whole lot more sense that it does not it's the people that are messing stuff up all right now the the chapter 63 is the teachings for the congregation and all the disciples of Christ and down here in 245 it says do you fear to speak to your brothers of the reincarnation of the spirit are you not persuaded of the love and justice that it holds yeah there is a contradiction uh, between or uh, uh, between resurrection and reincarnation they're, they're actually very very different when you actually start to think about it and we're going to show you the verses here and so look at verse 246 he says compare this form of restitution with the form men use to frighten the spirit of humanity eternal punishment in the perennial flames of the inferno tell me which of these forms give you an idea of justice that is divine perfect and merciful all right so it's talking about the hell story that you hear about down there at the church like we were saying earlier about how we get one chance to come down here to get it right and if we don't we burn in hell forever now that compared to the resurrection story which we're going to go into more detail on how resurrection of the flesh actually works let me jump back over to my notes it's kind of far down in there but we're actually going to speak to um how that thing actually how it actually works and what's actually going on with the resurrection of the spirit all right verse 247 says on one of them reveals cruelty limitless rancor and a desire for revenge while the other contains only forgiveness charity and hope of reaching eternal life 
Oh, how great a twisting of my teachings have suffered through the bad interpretations. All right. So and so and that's what we're working to clear up. This story that we've heard about us having to go and burn in hell forever is just not true. Um, and, and thank the father for the third testament of the Bible that come and clear some of this stuff up. But he's saying compare the two, you know, which one actually makes sense. You know, this is our father that we're talking about, the one who that created us. He, he is a he is the in the position of a parent. So he's kind of like our our heavenly daddy, you know, but he, he you know, so does it make sense that he's going to be so cruel that he's going to have such limitless rancor that he's going to take revenge on us for not getting these things right, that he's actually going to throw us in some lake of fire and let us burn forever? Without even giving us, you know, half of a chance. You know, we didn't really get that great of a chance when you think about, you know, how many people there are down here in these religious institutions that aren't aware of what they are teaching. But yet they seem to be put in positions of authority and are actually telling the rest of us what we're supposed to be feeling, thinking and believing. And so we're following after them because a lot of us think that we're supposed to be and we're being led astray. And for that, we're going to burn in hell. That's that really don't make sense, especially when you think of the father who is all about forgiveness. He's all about charity. You know, so what we're, what we're talking about is hope for reaching that eternal life. Verse 248 says, I prepare for you the struggle because I know that you will be opposed for what you teach. But if your brothers who oppose you are surprised by death and I ask them if they die in sin, which would they prefer? The eternal fire they believe in or an opportunity to purify themselves in life? I tell you truly, they will choose the latter solution, even if blinded by fanaticism, they fought against it in life. Meaning they even though this in, these individuals are fighting against the idea of reincarnation of the spirit nowadays if you ask them which one would you rather have you know you 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 die you you die all of a sudden you're going to burn in hell or you're going to have the opportunity to to uh live again be born again and have uh, another opportunity to learn what it was that you missed in one lifetime which one would you choose to be born again and get another chance or to burn in hell and that's what he's talking about here even if they are fighting through their fanaticism that meaning that they they believe that they that their church is the only church that's going to survive and their their truth is the only truth and they don't believe in anything else you know and all of that even though they're blinded by that fanaticism and they fought against uh the idea of reincarnation which one would they choose burning in hell or being born again you know i would believe they would choose to be born again who who would actually want to burn in hell but let's come over here and let's look at something on the internet right quick. Now, like I said, I've given another class on this. It's a kind of a short class that talks about um, reincarnation versus resurrection, where we came in and we looked at a guy named Justinian. And you can go over there and you can look him up on the web. Look on the Justinian uh, change the Bible, use words like reincarnation or resurrection, and you would find out how he and another individual, a lady, went in and actually changed the words of the Bible from reincarnation to resurrection. It used to have words in it like reincarnation. But when you go now and you look at the King James Version of the Bible, the word reincarnation is not listed in there anyway, anywhere. And that's because Justinian and his other individual went in and actually took those words out. Now, you could take the time to go ahead and push the pause button and read this. This is coming from a website called ancientorigins.net. And it's um, um, given a little bit of information about reincarnation and how it was taken removed from the Bible. Here is another passage that, like I said, you could push pause and read through it. But this is what I was looking for. In 553 AD, this information was declared heresy at the Second Council of Constantinople. Meaning these Catholic people, the Catholic Church 
had a council meeting, the Second Council of Constantinople, in 553 A.D. and decided to change the Bible and take out the word reincarnation and change it to resurrection simply because they didn't believe it. Or that it would hurt the church. This goes on to say the Catholic Church doctrine and the pre sources of wealth could have been in danger if people believed that they would come back to life many times. The old knowledge faced the same fate as many ancient books by pre Christian writers. The bishop was afraid of the knowledge, which could prove that the institution of the church wasn't the only option to bring eternal life. So they changed it. They changed the scripture even before our Bible was given out you got to remember that our bible didn't come out in english until 1611 this was way back in 553 that the scripture was changed so you have to find you a bible or you have to find the scripture that was written before 553 in order to see what it actually said when our bible says resurrection you would have to look and see what that bible actually said to see uh what was actually in there or not this is the catholic church that we're talking about but there are many people who are supporting this idea um, that the, the reincarnation shouldn't be in our Bible today and the idea of re reincarnation is not true or whatever. But these are individuals who are in support of what the, the Catholic Church um, doctrine is. They're actually teaching Catholic doctrine, which is resurrection. All right, jumping back over here in chapter 30 of the Third Testament of the Bible, we're going to jump down to verse 13. It says, how could you ever believe that on the day of judgment, the bodies of the dead would be resurrected and be united to their spirits in order to enter the kingdom of God? How can you interpret in that manner what you were taught in former times? How, how, and a lot of people don't. You know, if you think about it, what you're talking about is your body actually coming back up out of the ground and walking around. You're talking about the bodies of your great grandparents coming back up and walking around. How could we actually believe this? How, how could we really believe that this is what is actually being talked about? You know, what if those bodies were cremated? What if you're like Osama bin Laden where they threw you out in the middle of the ocean somewhere? Are you now going to have to be reincarnated or resurrected and you're going to have to walk on water? That's two big miracles right there that you're going to have to do just to get back. You know, what about people that their heads were cut off or something you know this is why there's individuals who are scared of of the apocalypse because they think there's going to be headless people walking around it's like all of the saints you know who were beheaded for the word of god they're going to be walking around their head is going to be in one place and their body's going to be in another this is the kind of stuff we're talking about when you're talking about the resurrection of the flesh but stick with it we're going to prove it like i keep saying we're going to prove this stuff so stay with it because we're going to jump over here in the third uh, in the King James version of the Bible. And we're going to show you that it will actually tell you reincarnation, even though the word isn't listed there. We're actually going to show you that that's actually what it was talking about. But let's go on right here. Verse 14 says the flesh is of this world and here it remains while the spirit arises free and returns to the existence where it emerged. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of my spirit is spirit. The resurrection of the flesh is the reincarnation of the spirit and if some believe that to be a human theory and others believe it to be a new revelation verily i say to you that i began to make it known to the world since the beginning of mankind proof of it can be found in the text of the scriptures which are a testimony of my works so basically what he's saying right here he's saying a mouthful right here in this verse 14 but down he's saying he's saying proof is in the scriptures now I, I I believe I believe the scripture. I believe in only two things in this world that are true. That's mathematics and that's the scripture. Those are the only two things that are not going to lie to you. The word of God and numbers. And so when it's telling me right here that the that the scripture proves that reincarnation is the resurrection of the flesh i jumped over there and i looked at it to find this proof that he's talking about and i found it but let's finish out this verse right here he's saying down here the flesh is of this world and in this world remains see 
this flesh that we have, like we said before, what do they say? Ashes to ashes and dust to dust. That that's where our bodies is going. It's 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 not going to go off into the spirit world. There's no material elements in the spirit world. There's no mass. There's no air. There's no fire. There's no water there, and there are no bodies there either. Our spirit is what's going to go on to this higher plane, to these higher mansions. But we're going to leave this body behind. And so it says the resurrection of the flesh is the reincarnation of the spirit and so what's actually going to be reincarnated is our or what's actually going to be resurrected is our spirits this our spirits is what's going to be reincarnated or our spirits is what's going to be resurrected resurrected all right so let's jump into this scripture that's talked about he says that it's in the scripture well he says is that and, and what he's talking about is the king james version of the bible so let's go over to the king james version and find out what he's talking about here all right first thing we're going to do go to is matthew chapter 10 verse 7 and 8 as ye go preach saying that the kingdom of heaven is at hand all right so now these are the commandments that we're getting from the father he or from the messiah he's telling us to go and teach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand but look at verse 8 it says heal the sick cleanse the lepers raise the dead cast out devils freely you have received and freely give now let's look at this really closely right here because he's given these commandments this is the messiah telling us he look at verse 9 he tells us how to don't provide any gold or brass or don't worry about two coats we remember that story there but look right here where he's saying heal the sick okay we can do that it says cleanse the lepers okay we should be able to do that too raise the dead who is actually raising the dead? If he really wanted us to raise a dead body, why when we go to funerals, aren't these people having some type of ceremony where they're actually trying to bring these people back to life? How many people have heard of people passing away suddenly and you have individuals crying and, and, and mom is, is there with this child and she's begging for him to come back to life and the child actually got back up and rose back to life? But is this a false commandment? Was he was he was he not serious when he told us to raise the dead or was he not talking about the bodies? Was he talking about raise the spirits of our brothers? Was he talking about raise the spiritually dead? I, it makes sense to me. If not, there would be individuals down at the graveyard right now praying for the dead to rise. We're commanded to do it. We're healing the sick. We're cleansing the lepers. We're even casting out devils. But ain't nobody raising the dead unless you think about the, the spiritually dead there ain't nobody out there raising the, don't no dead bodies nowhere in the world is this going on here so is this verse void or is it a misunderstanding it's a misunderstanding let's go on all right now let's jump over here to the first epistle of peter and look down here at chapter 3 verse 21 he says the like figure wherein to even baptism does also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him so now it's talking about the resurrection of the messiah we do know that he was resurrected but now is his flesh gone on into heaven there's a lot of people who's waiting for the messiah to come back in the flesh but i'll tell you those individuals are in error he's not coming back in the flesh he's coming back in the spirit all right, now let's go back to John and talk about Lazarus. We're talking about individuals that actually have come back from the dead. The Messiah was one. He definitely came back from the dead. There was other people that came back from the dead as well. And we're going to talk about those in the scripture here. We've already talked about the Messiah once. Now, down here in chapter 11, 
which I believe is in the book of John, he starts to talk about Lazarus and how this individual named Lazarus was actually, uh, he actually died. He was a friend of the Messiah. He died and the Messiah went in to actually resurrect his body. This is another person that we read in the Bible, a physical body that was actually resurrected according to the traditional way we think of resurrection and that is the body, the flesh actually coming back to life. There are a few cases, like we said, the Messiah was one. Lazarus was another. But let me show you right here in this point right here in 23. It says, Jesus said unto her, thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. OK, so let's look at this really, really closely here because we're actually talking about a person that was resurrected and the word resurrection is actually used. But look at some peculiar points here, how Martha says, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But notice up here, Jesus said unto him, thy brother shall rise again. He didn't say thy brother shall be resurrected. He said, thy brother shall rise again. And no, this Martha didn't say that I know he's a you can resurrect him now. She's talking about the resurrection at the last day. Right. And so my point is, is that even though you have Lazarus, who is actually being resurrected, the scripture does not say the word resurrected when it's talking about what actually happened to him. It said rise again. So that's letting you know that the word resurrected, the word resurrection has a different meaning than rise again. But let's go on to another point. The, the, the third testament says that it, the proof is in the King James Version. Well, let's find this proof in the King James Version. Let's go to uh, 2 Kings verses 8 and 5. Okay, now. You may not be familiar with Elisha. If you studied Kings, then you probably are familiar with this guy named Elisha or Elisha. He, well, he followed after uh, Elijah. Elijah who was translated after Elijah went up on the chariots of fire. This Elisha kind of got the mantle and kind of took over the responsibilities of Elijah. But one of the things that Elijah, what Elisha, one of the things that he did was he brought this child back to life he actually resurrected this child he went and laid on the individual put his hands on his hands put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes it says back there in in, in kings but if you look up here in eight and five it says and it came to pass as he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life that behold the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and for her land and Gehazi said my lord O king this is the woman and this is her son who Elisha restored unto life okay so here is a case of resurrection that actually happened in the bible but notice here here is the boy walking around this is the boy this is the son here you know it ain't some some super net some you know spirit being walking around this guy's actually talking to the king and pointing at this lady and pointing at her son that was brought back to life but even in this case it doesn't say re resurrected it said restored to life or he says restored a dead body to life he said restored to life but the son was actually walking there all right but let's go on Next, we're going to go to uh, Matthew chapter 27 and 53. All right. Now, here is another time that the word is resurrection is being used. But notice how it's not talking about people that was actually resurrected here in 27 and 53. He says, and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. These is talking about the bodies of people. 
And it, it says, let me go back to 51. He says, and behold, the veil of the temple was red in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. This is when the Messiah was put up on the cross. And he actually, after, the, after he had gave up the ghost, you had this big earthquake and all of this stuff going on with the temple. 52 says, and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. It didn't say resurrected. It said arose. But did they not have the word in their vocabulary? Oh, uh -uh, look at 53. It says, and and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So they're talking about the resurrection of the Messiah. But the, but you got a whole bunch of bodies out coming out of the grave and, and they did not resurrected. But let's go on. There's more proof. All right, now let's jump back over here to Matthew because there's a lot of people who will remember and want to bring up this story here. This is coming from the Sadducees. And remember we said that the Sadducees are ones who didn't believe in reincarnation or resurrection. They didn't even believe that people had spirits or whatnot. They, you know, hey, they, those guys are kind of odd. But it says, right, it's, it's talking about here how the they're talking about this lady who had these seven husbands and each of her seven husbands died. And then right here in 20 says therefore in the resurrection whose wife shall she be of the seven for they all had her Did, why are they talking about dead people getting married why, why think about this these are dead people she dead all of her husbands then died all eight of these people then been died they, they dead and they are rose up from the grave and now they talking about who gonna be whose wife these are dead people these are dead people you know Who's actually going to be thinking about getting married at that time? But they're not talking about the flesh. If you think about that, they're talking about the spirit. Now it makes sense. But if you think they're talking about the flesh, no, they stinketh. All right. So that's all I could all I could come up with as far as the people that actually died in, in the Bible and was actually resurrected. But you notice in every case, neither time was it was talked about how they were resurrected. It talked about how they were how they were raised from the dead or restored to life or something like uh, like that over there. There was another case. Uh, I can't remember if it was Ezekiel or something like that when you had these dry bones that came back to life and all of that. But even then it didn't use the word resurrected because it wasn't talking about the same thing all right so now let's change gears we're going to stay in the king's in the king james version but we're going to change gears and go in a slightly different direction talking about individuals who were reincarnated now they say, well, the word reincarnation is not in the Bible. Yeah, the word is not, but there are actually cases of reincarnation in the Bible. For instance, over here in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12, it says, And from the days of John the Baptist unto now, the kingdom of heaven suffer violence, and the violence take it by force. For all of the prophets and the law prophesied unto John, talking about John the Baptist. But look right here in verse 14, he says, And if you will receive it this is Elias which was for to come he that has an ear to hear let him hear he's telling you right there that John the Baptist was the reincarnated spirit of Elias or Elijah who was always the forerunner of Christ is telling you right there it doesn't say reincarnation but that's what he's saying and if you will receive it and there's some that ain't there's some that ain't gonna teach we're gonna talk about them in a minute too so stay tuned but there's some that's not gonna receive it but he said if you will receive it this is Elijah John the Baptist is Elijah now how is that possible they asked John the Baptist they asked him were you Elijah he said no is he a liar how would he have known that he was the reincarnated spirit of Elijah unless Elijah told him firsthand and evidently Elijah did not tell him that. So he didn't know it. So why he but he, but the Messiah told us that the Messiah said this is Elijah is the Messiah a liar. No, this is the reincarnated spirit of Elijah coming in the form of John the Baptist. And what does he say right here? He that has an ear to hear, let him hear. 
We're talking about times in the Bible where there was talk about reincarnation. Look up here in chapter 16 of the book of Matthew. Verse 13 says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, whom do, more, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say it's Elias and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, ain't this talking about reincarnation? You got the Messiah saying, who do these people say that I am? Some people say that you are Elias or Elijah. Some people say that you're Jeremiah. So how could he be Jeremiah? How could he be Elijah? How could he be one of the other prophets if he had not been the reincarnated spirit of those individuals? Now, I ain't saying that he was. He says John the Baptist there, too. But you know that John the Baptist wasn't him. He wasn't John the Baptist because John the Baptist was only six months older than he was. And he was about 30 some years old at this point. So but you got Elijah or Elias. You got to remember those words are interchangeable in the Old Testament says Elijah and in the New Testament says Elias. We understand that. But you, you, they're saying that it's possible that many people say that you are the reincarnated spirit of Elias. They, they didn't know who he was. But the thing is, they thought that he could be the reincarnated spirit of those individuals. So even back then, they did understand reincarnation. It was possible. They even thought it. The Third Testament says that the proof is in the King James Version. We believe the Third Testament of the Bible. So we believe that the proof is in here. So we're digging it out. Now, let's change another little speed and let's go. We're going to stay in the King James Version, but we're going to go a little bit slight different direction. Talking about this incorruptible stuff right here that we see up here in first Peter uh, chapter chapter one, verse 23. He says, and being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God was liveth and abideth forever. Talking about being born again. Now, we, that's where we started off this story. Talk back there with Nicodemus. But here you have Peter up here talking about being born again. This is the only time other time in the scripture that you hear about being born again. But it's talking about being born again, not of the corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible seed. Now, if you now th there's many people who want to say that he's talking about the resurrection of the flesh and being born again. You are still in the flesh. But how are you incorruptible if you still are? in the flesh no our flesh will always be corruptible until it will it will always be corruptible this the spirit that is incorruptible it's the spirit that he's talking about when he's talking about being born again he's talking about the spirit but i i know you're not convinced so let me pull out a few more verses now this is up here in first corinthians chapter 15 it's talking about the spiritual body opposed to the fleshly body Look down here at 15 and 35. He says, but some men will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? 36 says, thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. See, right. So right here, he's separating the idea of the spiritual body from the fleshly body, letting you know that uh -uh, our bodies have to die. But. Let's go. But let's look a little look at another verse here. So let's let's jump down to verse 42. He says, so so also in the resurrection of the dead, it is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sold in dishonor. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body. It is raised in a spiritual body. There is a natural body and a spiritual body. So he's separating the two, a natural body from a spiritual body, letting us know that when it comes to resurrection, it's not the natural body that is raised, but is the spiritual body that is raised. The natural body is sown, it's put in the ground, it's planted. But from that, then you then our spirit, what, what happens is our spirit is then separated from that natural body that's, that's going ashes to ashes and dust to dust. 
And that spirit being is then going on to hopefully a higher mansion or another existence. It is at least going into the spirit world, but it is not taking the natural body with it because there is such thing as a natural body and there is the such thing as a spirit body. Now, let's jump down to verse 50 and look what it says. Now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. So when it comes to resurrection of the flesh, look right here is telling you that flesh can't go into the kingdom of God. Flesh, flesh don't go. It's the spirit man that goes. Your flesh is not going to go. Flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither does corruption inherit incorruption. It's the spirit that's, that's being resurrected. And that's what Paul is trying to tell us here is that the spirit is what's being resurrected, not the flesh. All right. But let's jump back over to Peter and I'll show you that that is always the case. All right. So let's look over here. First Peter chapter one, verse nine. He says, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now, I did a search and the thing about it, there's no times in the Bible where it ever talks about your body being saved. Think about it. If if the, if he was talking about resurrection of the body, wouldn't there be some type of instructions for how we were to take care of our bodies after we're dead or whatever? There would be people who was trying their best to preserve their bodies, knowing that one day they were going to need them again. So we would be like Egyptians. We would get mummified and all it is. There there be people having us in cryo chambers where we were frozen, so that when we were resurrected, our bodies would look like it did when you know when we died or whatever but there's no cases of that there's no time ever in the bible that we're told to actually even think about our bodies after it was dead why because we ain't gonna need them no more there's no such thing as the resurrection of the body the third testament says the proof is in the bible so let's jump over to first corinthians chapter five and see some more proof verse five says to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So look at what's happening to the flesh here. It's the destruction of the flesh is even turning over to being turned over to Satan. But what is it? It's that the spirit may be saved. Letting us know that there's a different different definition. There's individuals talking about they're going to be saved, but they shouldn't be thinking about their bodies being saved. It is their spirit that they want to be saved because that's all the Bible speaks of is that the spirit is saved and the soul is saved. Never that the body is saved. Right here is saying that the body is turned over to Satan for its destruction. Right here in Psalms 72 and 13, he says, he shall spare the poor and needy and shall save the souls of the needy. He didn't say save the bodies. He said save the souls. Right here in 86, this is Psalms 86 and 2, it says, preserve my soul for I am holy. O thou God, save thy servant that trusteth in thee. He didn't say preserve my body. He don't care nothing about his body. It's his soul that he's interested in. That's what's going to be resurrected is our souls in the last days. Our bodies ain't going to be resurrected, guys. We're going to get some brand new bodies. That's what he's talking about when he talk about incorruptible bodies. There's a, there's a lot of individuals who want to talk about getting an incorruptible body. Well, you know what? That's a new body, ain't it? That's reincarnation. If you get a new body. Body, that's reincarnation Re a resurrection is when you got the same old raggedy body like the messiah had you remember you remember thomas got to stick his fingers in those holes that they had stabbed him in that's because the messiah had that same old body that they had put him up on the cross he was a resurrected spirit remember lazarus was walking around and they were all coming to the to, to see lazarus and all of that kind of stuff that's because lazarus was resurrected and he had the same old body that individual back in first king was down there talking to the talking to the king he had the same old raggedy body but not not us we're going to have our raggedy bodies is going into the holes it is our souls that's going to be saved look at verse 4 it says rejoice the soul of thy servant for unto thee O lord do i lift up my soul it's talking about the soul it's not talking about the body and never ever does it talk about the salvation of the body or even the resurrection of the body it is talking about the resurrection of the soul or the resurrection of the spirit down here in james 
Uh, chapter 121, it says, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engraftment word, the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Ain't nothing going to save your body. It's going to ashes to ashes. It's going dust to dust. It's your soul that you're worried about. But yeah, I'm looking at everything because, you know, everybody else is going to look at everything. Let's come up here to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 17. He says, and their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hamenaeus and Thelatus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrew the faith of some. OK, now. A lot of us may miss this, especially, you know, individuals that ain't really paying attention. We're talking about resurrection. We're talking about reincarnation. But look at what you got here. You got these two individuals that's being talked about how they are able to overthrow the faith of, of some individuals. Some individuals listen to these people and they were they were tricked or they were confused because these two individuals, Hamenaeus and Philetus, were in error. But what were they in error of? Saying that the resurrection had passed already the resurrection had passed already now okay think about this if the dead and already got up and start walking around who wouldn't know it who wouldn't already know that there are dead people walking around all of the dead saints are supposed to get up and walk around who's going to be tricked Who's going to be tricked? Who's going to, if, if you go out right here and tell people that the resurrection had already taken place and there are thousands, maybe even millions of dead people walking around, who's going to believe that? Who's going to believe that? I mean, you, you, you're going to be looking to see dead bodies, aren't you? You're going to be looking to see some, you want to see some dead people, right? You know, you want to go see uh, Abraham. You want to go see Jacob. You want to go see I, I, uh, Isaac and these individuals that's walking around because the, the, the resurrection had already took place. All of these people are supposed to be walking around now. Where are they at? No, they were talking about reincarnation. And when you're talking about the reincarnation of the spirit, now it's easy to overthrow the faith of some. Now it's easy to trick individuals now because how can you tell? You don't know who's been resurrected or you don't know who's been reincarnated in the who. You know, it, 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 it could be a little bit tricky then when you're talking about reincarnation. But when you're talking about resurrection, no, we, we, we need to see some dead people walking around if you're talking about resurrection. All right, now let's jump over here to St. Mark chapter 12 and 26. He says, as touching the dead that they rise, have ye not read in the books of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He, he talking about Moses back there when I mean, he was in uh, before he went back into Egypt to uh, bring the people out. Verse 27 says, he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err. Yeah. So th what is this sad here is that those individuals were not dead. They, their bodies were in some caves or whatever, but the spirit being lived on. And that's what he's saying there in Mark chapter 12 and verse 27 is that the spirit man, the spirit beings or the spirit bodies of these individuals were living and were living during that day. They're still living. They aren't dead. The spirit doesn't die. The body dies, but the spirit doesn't die. And that's why he's saying right there, he is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Those individuals are even now still living. But, you know, a lot of people going to have a problem with this. I know they, they are. But let's stay with the book of Mark and come back here to chapter 2 and verse 22. And, and, and you'll see why. He says, and no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine does burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. For new wine must be put into new bottles. See, you know, so you can't you can't really blame those guys that, that are rejecting this idea of the Third Testament or rejecting the idea of the reincarnation of the Spirit. 
because they're old wine bottles. These people have been hearing these stories, these false doctrines, these errors, these misunderstandings for years, if not decades. And now you come and you try to explain it to these individuals. That's like putting old, putting new wine into an old bottle. What happened is when it, some of the scripture or some of the translations use the term wine skins is because these were actually skins that they were putting this, this wine into. And wine, as you know, it has to breathe. It has to, to expound and contract. And when you put this, this, this new wine that's going to have to expound and contract into uh, an old, hard, crusty, old uh, wine skin, it's going to break the bottle and some of that wine is going to spill out. And so that's why, you know, a lot of those individuals are rejecting the, the, the Third Testament. They're rejecting this, this, this information that we have now, this understanding that we have now. Their, their wine bottle, their wine skin is just old and crusty. You know what I'm saying? So maybe we aren't bothering them too much. And we don't. We don't go over there picking on their channel and, you know, mess with them. They they come over here talking to us, you know. But, but you know, we have new wine skins. We have new bottles that we're putting new wine into. It's just that some of these old bottles want to get a sip of this new wine. And, you know, they're they going to they gonna get broke. We have a responsibility for those who are thirsting for truth and thirsting for knowledge. We can't worry too much about those individuals who have these crusty old wine bottles. Now, I say that to say this is that, you know, a whole lot of people are going they're going to run back to the Greek and they're going to say, OK, well, the, 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 when you when I go back to the Greek, trans, when I go back to the tr Greek translations of the Bible, it talks about resurrections as well. Well, you know what? The, the Bible wasn't written in Greek. None of the scripture was written in Greek. None of those guys were Greek. All of those guys were Hebrews. They were Hebrews. They weren't Greek. Look at over here at uh, Google. It says the Hebrew and Aramaic premise hypothesis posits that the gospel of Matthew was originally written in Hebrew or Aramaic. Now, that's a fancy way of saying those people who knew what they were talking about knew that the Bible was written in Hebrew and Aramaic. Matthew was a Hebrew as well. All of the apostles were Hebrew. All of the disciples were Hebrew. Everybody involved in this story pretty much except for pi except for you know the the, the the Caesar and them guys and the soldiers and all of them people and the, you know those guys were Greek everybody else was Hebrew but let me show you you know you got to go back to the Bible to some people that's going to doubt and like you talk about these wine skins that's been heard all of the time that the Bible was written that the New Testament was written in Greek let's come over here to first Corinthians chapter 11 I mean, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and let's look. Here you have Paul telling these individuals, look, I'm a Hebrew. They said, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Paul was not Greek. Paul was Hebrew. So do you think he wrote in Greek? Here you are over here in Acts chapter 21, verse 37. They're asking Paul, even if he speaks Greek, he says, and Paul was led into the castle and he said unto the chief captain, may I speak unto thee who said, can thou speak Greek? So he's even asked. So, he, so here's Paul even being questioned on whether or not he spoke Greek. So what language was he must have been speaking to the guy? He must have been speaking Hebrew. And then you look down here, at verse 40, he says, and when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with his hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spoke unto them in the Hebrew tongue. So look, even being defiant, he's still going to speak to the people in Hebrew. Paul spoke Hebrew. But let's see who else. This is down here and still in Acts chapter 26 and verse 14. He says, and when... We were all fallen to the earth. I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Here it is, the Messiah speaking in Hebrew. Even the Messiah didn't speak in Greek. He's talking in Hebrew too. So when you think that Paul wrote the, the epistles in Greek or when the gospel was written in Greek, you're actually in error. And that's why a lot of these guys want to run back to the Greek because the Greek was already corrupted by five, by the fifth century AD or by the sixth century AD. The Greek was already corrupted. They had already changed the word in there that ain't reliable you can't go to that information it's already messed up 
the Bible was written by Hebrews, guys. And sometimes they use Aramaic, but they didn't write in Greek. That was a translation to put it in the Greek. The Bible was translated into Greek. So don't think that you can go back to the Greek and look and see, you know, and prove something. You can't. You have to go back to the Hebrew or you have to go back to the Aramaic in order to prove what the words were originally stated. So when it says so when the third testament says that the the proof is in the scripture when it says that the proof is in the books that we call the Bible the Old Testament and New Testament there it is we've seen proof after proof that it was talking about reincarnation and never was it talking about resurrection except when you're talking about the Messiah himself or Lazarus or or that lady and her son every other time it's talking about the resurrection of the spirit and that's what needs to be understood here is the resurrection of the spirit but we're not finished don't go nowhere yet we still got a wealth of information to talk about here let's come back over to the third testament chapter 30 this section is called the universal school of life i want to talk about two verses in here it says since the beginning of humanity reincarnation of the spirit has existed as a law of love and justice and is one of the forms in which the father has demonstrated his intimate or infinite clemency reincarnation is not only of this time but of all times but do not think that this mystery has not been revealed before now from the first times an intuition has existed in man about the reincarnation of the spirit yeah guys if you think about it people know that they have a spirit man people know that they're going to live forever if you think about it do you does it does it really make sense to you that one day your lights can actually put be put out and there's going to be nothing there but nothing you can't even say darkness there's just going to be nothing there that you're just going to go away that's almost unfathomable to most of us then there's some that's you know really materialistic that believe that believe that this is the only life we have and once we close our eyes that's it but for the rest of us no we have by intuition that is saying right there we have an intuition that lets us know that our spirit man is different and our spirit man is going to live forever verse 57 said yet this humanity seeks in material sciences and the riches of the world have allowed itself to be dominated by the passions of the flesh hardening in those senses with which the spiritual is perceived making itself blind and deaf to that which corresponds to the spirit and that's what I was just talking about the only people who can think the think of that their lights are going to get turned out one day and there's going to be nothing to them left that, that that's why is because of the riches or the material sciences and the riches of this world have allowed itself to be dominated by the passions of the flesh hardening those senses it taking them away materialism riches of the of this world those kind of things are blocking out your spirit man they're, they're, they're closing it down to where you don't even know your spirit man exists much less can communicate with it commune with it take advantage of its powers and, and, and different stuff uh -uh, that's what's doing it what is a material science and the riches of this world let's jump down here to verse 74 in the section called the power of conviction of the doctrine of reincarnation this is still in chapter 30 it says verse 74 says spiritual enlightenment is revealing to the world the truth the justice the reason and the love that exists in the spiritual gifts of reincarnation nevertheless in the beginning the world will fiercely battle this revelation labeling it as strange and false doctrine in order to make men of good faith distrust it and see this is what's going on this is why I'm doing this video this is why I'm putting so much time and effort and verses into this video is because of my channel is being bombarded by all of these people who are doing just this they're fiercely battling the revelation they're fiercely battling the idea that there could be a reincarnation of the spirit and they're labeling it as strange they're labeling it as false doctrine and why does they say that they're doing this in order to make men of good faith distrust it in other words they want you who are otherwise looking and getting this information they have nothing better to do than to come on this channel and come on these videos and put wicked and blasphemous comments down there in the in the comment section just to make you distrust the word like like i've read one time
time in the scripture where it says they're like dogs that sleep in the in in the crib house with the cows. They don't want to eat and they don't want the cows to eat either. Meaning they don't want nothing to do with the kingdom of heaven and they don't want you to go into the kingdom of heaven either. So it, what do they do? They come in and they put comments to make you distrusted, to make you feel like, well, I don't know if it's real or not. That's the only thing that they're doing. Look at verse 75. He says the efforts of the religions to maintain their faithful in the routine of old beliefs and methods beyond their time shall be useless and vain for none can stop the divine light that penetrates to the depths of understanding awaken the spirit to an era of revelations of divine confidences and clarification of doubts and mysteries and of all spiritual liberation yeah they wasting their time because not only are you getting it from me not only are you getting it from the third testament not only are you getting it from other channels but you're getting it intuitively the father is speaking his message to your heart he's speaking his message to your spirit they can't do nothing they just wasting their time wasting electrons sending that garbage across the airways they need to find something better to do quit blaspheming the scripture they're gonna get themselves in trouble but you know what that's their business let's go on to chapter 54 all right now this section is called the rejection of the spiritual revelations and spiritual healings down here in verse 41 it says the spiritual valley shall come yet closer to men to give them testimony of his existence and its presence on all roads there shall be signs evidence and revelations and messages that insistently proclaim that a new era has begun see that's what's going on guys we're stepping into the new era that's why you have the third testament of the bible see when we entered the first era that was back there with moses and what did we get as as, the, as humanity was changing they needed a new document and new rules to go by and that's why moses got a a testament of the bible that's why he got the scripture in order to give the people the rules of the road and what they needed to go by and then in the second era when you got the messiah again the world was changing there was a different thing going on they call that the beginning of the age of pisces or something like that or the piscean age where man was 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 more likely to be deceived by by different forces and stuff like that you got a new document and new scriptures to go by that's what we call the second era and now we're going into the third era this is the era of spiritualization this is the era where what like it says right there the spiritual valley shall come closer to man this is where we're going to start learning how to pray where we're going to start learning how to control the elements this is where we're going to learn how to how how to communicate with the father spirit the spirit and a whole lot of other things and in this time we need a new document to go by that's why we have the third testament of the bible and just like the new testament it didn't take nothing away from the old testament the third testament it ain't going to take nothing away from the the second testament or the first if anything it's going to help clarify a lot of that was went on in those times just like this one is doing right here let's look at verse 42 he says there shall be struggle and there shall be an upheaval in the peoples for the religious shall sow fear in those who believe these messages and science shall deny the truth of those happenings see this is what you have going on here this is the reverend pastor deacon dr doug trying to save everything that he's built up all of this time knowing that spiritualization can crush that he's built up this material empire where he has all of his fine stuff his homes his cars and all of this fine stuff his luxury items but he know that the spirit world is different he know that being spiritualized is different you're not focused on materialistic stuff and he believes all of that stuff is in jeopardy and so he's fighting tooth and nail in order to save it and so what does he do he come on to these channels like these and like other channels and say that the third testament is not real and say that the spiritualization movement is not real and all of this other stuff but you know what that's why we have the truth that's why we have the third testament to tell us that this stuff is coming on so when we see these guys showing up and start sending it, all of these these hate messages blaspheming the holy spirit and all of this let's put them in a place just shut them down you know let them know ain't nobody listening to that stuff ain't nobody got time for that look right here in chapter 7 
of the third testament of the bible verse 39 says do not be disturbed when they tell you that he who has spoken to you during this period has been the tempter or that it was foretold that he would also perform miracles with which he would perturb and confuse the very chosen ones truly i say to you that many who think in this way about my manifestation will be those who actually are in the service of evil and in darkness although their lips try to assure that they are always spreading the truth see there the third testament calls them out it's saying don't be worried about these guys blaspheming the word talking all of this junk he said they, they're the same ones that go come on here and tell you that you have been tricked by the tempter these are the same people that's actually going to be in service of evil they're following the pope's doctrine they're listening to the pope over the father they put the pope or they put the catholic church or they put church doctrine in the place of the father's doctrine they don't even believe the old testament they don't believe in moses or they will be keeping the commandments they will be keeping the covenant they will be obeying the statutes the laws the precepts the ordinances but they don't believe in that stuff and then when you look at the messiah who said that he didn't come to destroy the law but he came to fulfill the law and anybody who teaches against the law that will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven they still talking down on the law and saying that we ain't supposed to be keeping the law and then they expect you to believe them when they come on here and start talking about the third testament ain't true they didn't say that the first testament wasn't true they said that the second testament wasn't true and now they're gonna come in here and tell you that the third testament ain't true all the time while they doing what their lips try to assure that they are always spreading truth no they ain't they are in service of evil and are in darkness in service of evil and are in darkness ain't nobody got time for that but let me calm down we can already wrap this up don't go yet I still got a whole bunch of important information to talk to in these last few minutes. Do not click off yet. But there's a lot. But let me go ahead and change speeds here. I think we done got the message across. I think I, I think you understand that now it was just a misunderstanding. The resurrection of the flesh is the reincarnation of the spirit it was all a big must understanding there are not going to be dead people walking around headless people walking around you know they not coming back your old you know granddaddy or you know he's not coming back up out of the grave that's not going to happen what well, is going to happen let me let me show you a little bit about what is going to happen i'm gonna catch my breath let me calm down as we start to wrap this thing up. We're still up here in chapter 7, verse 36. He says, This third era is the time of resurrection. The spirits had seemed dead, and the bodies their sepulchres. But the master has come before them, whose word is of life to speak to them, saying, Arise, and rise to the light, to freedom. See, this is what he was talking about. Resurrection is our spirit man is being resurrected. And even and, and, and there's a lot of people walking around. We're, we're out of touch with our spirit. Our spirits actually seem like they're dead. They, they because they they are like paralyzed. They're in there and they, you, you don't hear any movement out of them. They're powerless. They're weak right now. Beat down by what does it say? Materialism and the riches of this world. And so this is what's happening. This is the this is the resurrection of those spirits right and so you think of the resurrection as being that your spirit man is being brought back to life but you also have to think that your spirit man is actually going to live for forever and even though your body is going to go in a hole you know in so many years from now some of you may live to be 115 130 years old maybe or whatever but eventually it's going to perish eventually it's going to go away ashes to ashes and dust to dust but your spirit man is going to live forever and if you haven't done everything that you need to do down here on the earth you'll be back you'll be like it like the father told nicodemus you'll be born again you'll be back down here in order to finish out the missions that were put before you like i said got a lot of important information to go in these last few minutes of this video we're going to jump over here to uh chapter 30 now let me tell you how this all works you know, praise the Father for the third testament of the Bible because 
this thing actually has so much information in it. It tells us right here how the spirit works. Well, the cycle of the spirit is what I labeled this section of the video. Starting right here in verse 86. He says the spirit returns to earth and seeks a small and tender human body in order to rest in it and begin a new journey. It finds the small child designated to it and unites with that body in order to make restitution for its felons within my law. Knowing what it must do and aware that it belongs to the father, the spirit comes to earth clearly aware of its mission. All right. So here we have our reincarnated spirit. Now, this is what's going to happen after you die. So you die. You go into the spirit world. OK, now. Some other stuff happened while you're in the spirit world. We're going to get that to that in a second. But now here you are ready to come back down here to earth. And what does it say? The spirit spirit returns to earth and seeks a small and tender human body in order to rest in it. Meaning the spirit man comes down here and finds a baby, a brand new baby, it finds the small child designated to it and unites with that body in order to make restitutions for its failing. We're talking about the body that is assigned to your spirit. Now, it's the father who assigns these these bodies to the spirit. He unites it. He actually picks the family that you are supposed to be with. All of this information is in the third testament of the Bible. He picks the family that you are supposed to be with. You are then born in into that perfect family, the family that it is for for your spirit to be to, to nourish your particular spirit. It finds that child, that child that is designated to it in order to make restitution for its failing within my law. And that's important there because once we learn to 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 not fail within the law, once we learn to live within the law, we don't have to be reincarnated down here anymore. We don't have to come back. But until we get that Thing right we we've had to keep coming down here over and over and over learning how to do just that he says knowing what it must do and aware that it belongs to the father the spirit comes to the earth clearly aware of his mission now so look at this part right here go out this think of a newborn baby maybe you guys have a newborn baby around but think of this is what's going on in this child that haven't yet learned yet uh the ways of the world maybe between the ages of you know maybe less than two years old he said the spirit comes to the earth clearly aware of his mission clearly aware of his mission Mission. This child is aware of its mission. It's too young to know anything about anything else, but it's aware that it has a mission here on the earth. And, you know, the thing about it, you know, you can go over and you can study on the Internet about how these how these children are are aware of their other they, they, they are aware of some of this stuff. It, it was kind of strange to see over there that there's there's children even in America that are aware of this kind of stuff. And but they're really young children, even before the age of two, like I said, because the ways of the world starts to change all of that. Let's look at verse 87. He says in the first years, it is innocent. It preserves its purity and remains in contact with the spiritual life. OK. Then it begins to know sin. It looks closely at pride, arrogance, and at the rebelliousness of men before the just laws of the father and the flesh, which is stubborn by nature, begins to contaminate itself with evil. Having fallen into temptation, it forgets the mission which it brought to the earth and arises performing deeds which are contrary to the law. The spirit and the material body eat the forbidden fruits. And when they have fallen into the abyss, the last hour surprises them. Look at that, guys. That's our cycle right there. That's what happens to us. That's what happens to our spirit. We come down here innocent. We come down here pure. We come down here in touch with the spiritual world. But then what happens we start noticing sin. We start noticing bad things going on in this world. Our parents start corrupting us, turns out. We start seeing stuff like pride. We start seeing stuff like arrogance and rebelliousness and, you know, um, before the laws of the Father. And what do we do? We start embracing that stuff. And the more we get more we pick up stuff like pride and arrogance and rebelliousness and the other sins of the flesh, 
which is it, which it says right here, which are stubborn by nature. We begin to contaminate ourselves with evil. And so that's what's going on with that little young child there. Even though he's pure and he's innocent, he is contaminating himself with evil and have fallen into temptation. It forgets the mission which it brought to the earth and and arises performing deeds which are contrary to the law. Every one of us came down here with a mission. Every one of us came down here having made a contract with the father on something we would do down here on earth. An important mission that was assigned to us. But what happened is when we became sinful individuals, we actually forgot that mission. We forgot what it was that we were supposed to be doing down here. The spirit and the material body eat the forbidden fruits, meaning we start doing those things that we ain't supposed to be doing and further separating ourselves from the father. And when they have fallen into the abyss, the last hour surprises them, meaning after we have died, after we've we've gone and all turned wicked. Let us say we all sinners after we've all, you know, lived this now sinful life. And then it says the last hour surprises us, meaning, you know, the time when our bodies are separated separated once again from our spirits then we're surprised it's like we remember that hey wait who are we supposed to what what didn't we have a mission down here look at verse 88 he says once again the spirit finds itself in the spiritual valley weary and burdened by the weight of its faults then it remembers the voice that spoke to it in another time, which still calls to it. And after much weeping, feeling lost and not knowing who it is, it remembers that it has already been in that place. Meaning we start to recognize from where we've come. Our spirit man is, is starting to see the path home and starting to see, starting to recognize, oh man, I've, I've lost contact with this spirit world. I've lost contact with, with who I am. I had a mission and, 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 and I messed it up. And that's where all of this weeping comes from and this feeling of this lost feeling comes from. And it says, and not knowing who it is, it remembers that it has already been in that place so we start to remember that we've been there before that's where we was at before we was born into this life up there in that spirit world once again we find ourselves up there again now having now we still haven't completed that mission now here in verse 89 he says then the father who has created it with so much love appears on his path asking who are you from where do you come and where do you go right and then look at verse 90 he says the son recognizes in that voice the word of the one who has given it its existence intelligence and gifts the voice of the father who always forgives who purifies and removes the darkness and leads it to the light the child trembles because it knows it is before the judge and speaks saying father my disobedience and my debts to you are very great and I cannot aspire to live in your home for I have no merits today when I return to the spiritual valley I see that I have only accumulated faults for which I must now make restitution so now <laughs> Now that we've gave up, we've we've given up the ghost, we've lost our motive force, we've lost our body and have now been thrust back into the spirit world. We start to hear the voice of the father. But the thing about it, he's so pure and he's so holy that when we find ourselves any, anywhere close to his presence, it reminds of uh, it reminds us of how sinful we are and how we don't deserve to be there. And, and right there where he's saying, I see that I have only accumulated faults for which I must make restitution. And guess what happens next, guys? Verse 91. But the loving father once more points out the way. And once again, the spirit incarnates and the forms a part of humanity. Meaning we get to come back down here to earth and try all over again. That's why we've been down here so many times is because we've been given chance after chance to get this thing right. But because of what did it say? Arrogance, because of pridefulness, because of the ways of this world, we have contaminated ourselves and messed up our missions that we had. And so we, when we get ready to try to go off to those higher mansions, we are blocked by our conscience. We, our conscience makes us feel like we are sinful individuals and we don't deserve to go on 
Look at verse 92. And now experience and with greater strength and then subdues the material body in order con to control it and to obey the divine dictates. The battle begins. The spirit combats the sins which cause men to fall and wants to take advantage of the opportunity which has been granted for its salvation. It struggles from the beginning to end. And when the white hair shine on the temple and the body which before was strong and healthy begins to slowly stoop under the weight of the years of lost energy, then the spirit feels strong, more developed and experienced. Meaning we realize that we are supposed to be doing something good. Now we have come down to this earth, been reincarnated again, and we're living a different life. We're not letting arrogance, pride, and the ways of this world mess us up so bad. And so now we take advantage of the opportunity which has been granted for its salvation. Now we're taking advantage of these opportunities. He says, how great and disgusting sins appear to that being. It leads that sin and reaches the end of his journey now it only awaits the moment in which the father will call it for it has come to the conclusion that the divine law is just that the will of God is perfect and that the father lives in order to give life and salvation to his children so now in this lifetime we messed up in the other lifetimes but in this lifetime praise the Lord hopefully I should say we, we start to understand what does it say that his divine law is just that we shouldn't be rejecting it that the that the will of God is perfect so this lifetime is is the one that hopefully will get things right and then we're able to go on to those higher mansions it says when the last day comes it feels death in its flesh and has no pain it departs silently and respectfully it contemplates itself in the spirit and that if it had a mirror before it sees itself as beautiful and radiant with light then the voice speaks to it and asks child where are you going? And knowing who it is, it approaches the father, allows his light to invade its being and speaks thus. O creator, O universal love, I come to you to rest and to give to you the fulfillment of my mission. We're talking about our cycle, our spiritual cycle here. This is what happens. We realize that his law is just. We realize that we're supposed to be obedient, that we're supposed to be going along with his will. Now we've lived a different kind of life. And now that we have perished and have gone on into the spirit world, now we have no problem standing before him now we want to see him now we want his light to shine on us we don't feel so sinful we don't feel feel so bad about the life that we've lived now we're not begging to go back down there to earth to make things better now we're ready to go on to these higher mansions now that we have fulfilled our mission now we're ready to go on to some other mission we ain't trying to come back down here to this rock he says the account is settled the spirit is healthy cleansed and free of the chains of sin and sees before it the reward which awaited it then it feels that it merges with the light of the father that is joy is greater and it contemplates a mansion of peace a holy land a profound silence then it remains at rest in the bosom of Abraham. Now we're ready to go on to that higher mansion, guys. We hear about those many mansions that the father has, but we have to get this one right down here. And that's why I wanted to go through that, that story there, talking about how our spirits are reincarnated, talking about the cycle of our spirit. All right. But don't go yet. We ain't finished yet. We ain't finished yet. We still got a couple of more things to talk about here. We're going to go all the way up here to chapter 63. It says, you have been prepared to fulfill this great mission in the third era. Today, you know that in your bosom, I have caused the people of Israel to be reincarnated. This I reveal to you. Understand that the seed that breathes in your being and in the inner light that guides you is the same that poured out since the first era over the house of Jacob. Look, guys, I know I messed that up in my reading. I'm sorry I'm such a slow reader. But 
understand what he's saying here. He's saying that the individuals that are hearing this third testament of the Bible, that are hearing these new revelations, that are hearing this and are on this mission in the third era, you individuals who are obeying the law, who are obeying the scripture, who are doing what you're supposed to be doing, charitable deeds and all of that. He's saying that you are the reincarnated spirit of Israel right here. You see that? Read it for yourself. That's what he's saying. You are the same individuals that was there in the first era. You are the individuals that was there with Moses. When Moses was standing up under the Mount Horb and, they, and that lightning was flashing and the, and the thunderings and the trumpets were blowing and he was there getting the Ten Commandments. You were standing there, guys. We were standing there. We was getting that information then and that's why we are the ones who are getting this information now. You remember the promises that was given to those individuals. Well, we are the ones now who are receiving the gift of those promises. That's what he's saying there. Read it for yourself. He says, you are Israelites to the spirit. You possess spirituality, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are branches of the blessed tree that gives both shade and fruit to humanity. Talking about you individuals. See, in the third, and I know I don't have all of the verses right here to back up what he's saying right here or what I'm about to say, but you are the reincarnated spirits of these individuals. This is why you're able to hear the third testament all of those people on there talking about i don't believe this and i don't believe that they are the reincarnated spirits of the same ones that put the messiah on the cross they are the same ones that was talking all of that junk back there in the second era they're the same ones that was back there at in in and they got burned up in the in the desert there with moses that their, their spirits have been reincarnated too but the ones who are hearing this messages we're the, we're the good guys <laughs> Verse 11 says, that is why I named you my firstborn and why I sought you out in this era to manifest in you my third revelation to the world. Meaning this is why you guys here in the third testament, if you look at these videos that's being pushed up, guys, there's only a few people that are actually listening to these videos. If you look over even at the third testament of the Bible and see the audio book. There's only a few thousand people that have actually listened to that thing. It's been up since about 2006 or so. And there's only a few thousand people that's actually listened to that thing. Why? It's only certain people that are supposed to get it. And look right here. He's saying, this is why I call you my firstborn. This is why I sought you out in this era to manifest in you my third revelation. Meaning, it ain't by accident that you get in the third testament of the Bible. It ain't no accident at all. He led you to it. And it ain't no accident that them other guys aren't getting into it they just haven't been led to it they ain't been led to it yet they're gonna get it one day maybe in the spirit world verse 12 says it is my will that the people of israel resurge spiritually among humanity so that they may behold the true resurrection of the flesh see this is why they don't want you to understand the true resurrection of the flesh is because when they start to make you understand when you start to understand that you are reincarnated spirits then it starts to make sense well wait a minute i've lived before maybe i lived during these eras maybe i was there with moses maybe i'm somebody special but if they talking about if they say that you live one life and you're ready to be thrown in a hole then you ain't nobody if you ain't done nothing good in this life then you must not have never done nothing good ever and you must be worthless worthy only to be their slaves to materialism or what this is why they don't want you to understand that information this is why the pope is trying to keep it from you this is why his the pope's minions are trying to keep it from you this is why they're trying to block this information out they don't want you to know it they don't want you to know who you are and who are you what does it say Israel you are the resurgence of spiritual Israel the resurgence of spiritual Israel the reincarnated spirits of Israel all right this is the last verse we're going to talk about down here in verse 49 again this is uh coming out of chapter 39 so if you want to push the pause button and read about the 144,000 chosen you can do so up here we're going to jump all the way down here to verse 49 which says i tell you who hear me learn to pray and keep visual to carry your cross with love and practice righteousness and obedience so that this life, which has been the most luminous reincarnation of your spirit, is not sterile, 
making you lament the time lost and the gifts unused. All right, guys. So this is why we work so hard. This is why we're trying to get an understanding. This is our most luminous reincarnation ever. This is the best time ever for our spirit. We have the Bible now. Remember, we didn't get that thing until 1611. You know, so it was hard for us to even understand what the law was before then. And, you know, and, and now we're living in this era. We have the information. We could do a lot of stuff in this in this lifetime that we haven't been able to do in our previous lifetimes. And so what we have to do, we have to take advantage of it so that it's not sterile making us lament the time lost and the gifts unused so see what it says right here learn to pray learn to pray that's important spirit to spirit communication you can hear about prayer on our channel we teach about prayer on our channel turns out most people don't know how to pray so check it out because you may maybe some areas that you can have to improve and on your prayer keep visual that means keep watch keep looking out for them it says and carry your cross with love, this is all of the bad stuff that's happening to us, guys. We have to learn to, to embrace it with love. Don't fight. Don't rebel when people slander your name, put you down, and all of that kind of stuff. You got to be, like be like the Messiah and forgive them. Practice righteousness. That's doing the law and being obedient. All of that stuff. The only thing I didn't mention right here is charitable deeds. I don't know why I didn't mention doing charity for one another. It should have. We got to love one another. We got to do stuff for each other. All right, I'm going to wrap it up there. If you got any questions, if you got any comments, please leave them below. Hit the like button if you got anything out of it. Hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so. Um, you, you might not see our videos pop up like you see other people's videos. It's because, you know, there's a lot of suppression going on with this type of information. People don't want this kind of stuff to get out. So you may be missing a lot of videos that we're putting out. So go ahead and hit the uh, subscribe button. Hit that bell button so you can see these videos when they come out. All right, continue to pray for us. Shalom.